Hi, Misha here, and, well, we're over a thousand videos, and now I'm going to do a three-parter, looking at the U.S. Colonial Marines, and have several NECA figures, as well as my Eagle Moss die-cast models. Now, I did do one big video looking at Alien, kind of retelling the story. That's not exactly what this is going to be, a retelling of Aliens. This is going to be looking more at the uh, the Marine Corps. And in video one, we're going to look at the big hardware the ships used. A bit of the command structure, maybe. Then in video two, we'll look at the equipment especially the the guns and other things and then in video three we'll talk about the individual marines and some of maybe their more personal equipment and customizations that kind of thing so if that sounds interesting to you let's hang out this week and uh, do it so with that we'll begin with part one and we'll begin with the biggest element here the uss Sulaco. We begin this long series, or we have to, with the USS Sulaco. This is a Conestoga class light assault carrier, served as a transport combat support vehicle, and she was unlucky number 13 in the class, which was introduced in 2155. And, uh, they were used throughout the colonies for transportation, support, logistic, and also combat operations. This is a quite large vessel, 385 meters long, although obviously not as wide or tall. It has a total of six decks, although four of them are for people inhabited. The other two are for machinery and, and cargo and just, you know, can be unpressurized. It's about uh, 78,000 tons and can haul up to 20,000 more tons in cargo. And uh, it does have a tachyon shunt for FTL, faster than light. It's capable of about 0 0.74 light years per day. So, yeah, not bad. And for sub light, it has rocket engines powered by industrial carbon diamond and to power it all we have a fusion plant with uh, lithium hydroxide as kind of the main catalyst and it is fully automated fully controlled by an artificial intelligence and AI with an artificial person which in this case would be Bishop as executive officer kind of monitoring everything and it can fully operate by itself in fact it's triple redundant there's the main ai and then a backup and then a tertiary kind of emergency backup and uh, in this role it can fly itself navigate plot courses return to base provide emergencies even go into basic combat with basic maneuvers pretty advanced for what it was it um was designed to support a maximum crew of 90 in hypersleep for a long duration, although it could support up to 2,000 in an emergency evacuation roll if they bloated the uh, cargo hold, which it had quite large with uh, additional hypersleep chambers. But this can only be you know, for a little bit. There's not a power for more. And it um, had two ready rooms, Two briefing areas, two kind of activity areas that could each support up to 36 Marines. A typical full platoon would be 25 plus support. We'll get to that later on. So it was uh, ready to go. And it could carry up to eight UD-4 Cheyenne dropships. Although four was more common, more or less standard. And in the film, because it was a light mission, it only carried two. It also could carry up to four assault or cargo shuttlecraft, which are a little bit larger 
bulkier, that kind of thing. And of course it had the emergency evacuation vehicle that we saw in Alien 3 in case of, well, emergencies, because that's what they're for. And it had typical things like uh, long-range communications, sensors, and all that. Now, this is the standard size model from Eagle Moss. Picked it up a long time ago. They do, or they did, when Eagle Moss was around, make an XL version. I considered getting it, but I already had this one. Plus, while, you know, if you give me a choice, either or, I already had this one. And we get the other one, but it's not that much larger because this is already kind of their special size. The uh, XL is about 13, 13 and a half inches. And this thing here is about 11, 11 and a half. So a couple inches longer, which uh, who doesn't like a couple more inches? But it wasn't worth swapping this out for that one. So this is the one I have, and it is very heavy, die cast metal. Aside from the sticky yachty bits, it's uh, pretty much all metal. It's a very chunky thing, and it's one of the very few Eagle Moss models that actually plugs in into a hole versus being cradled. So, like I said, this is a transport and an assault vessel. We've talked about what it transports, but what about assaulting, which is kind of what it's up to and why there's a bunch of sticky yachty bits. Here's its armament. Its biggest, longest range guns were two neutron particle beam weapons, which were mainly for disrupting electronics and electronic devices. Those were followed by four rail guns. These are massive rail guns, uh, two per turret, two and two, which could uh, have a high rate of fire, high velocity. Obviously for punching through armor, space targets, the like. It also had eight long-range ASAT anti-satellite missiles, which were for taking out satellites and other space targets. And for more close-in work, it had 80 maneuvering entry vehicles, MIRVs, basically, like kind of like, ICBMs, but instead of going up from Earth and then coming back down, they would just go down. And these could be fitted with uh, bunker busters, fragmentation, even nuclear warheads. And for blockade missions and other things, it could lay up to 60 space mines. And of course, it would have various point defense systems. And it doesn't do a whole lot of good for an offense if you don't also have some defensive capabilities. Primary defense came from two MW-80 point defense laser systems. These could take out fighter craft, warheads, and thanks to the AI control even shoot down some uh, kinetic things like railgun rounds. Quite impressive. In addition, it had two fully automated defensive decoy drones and 20 smaller drone pallets to kind of take away missiles. And in addition to that, it had radar absorbing construction, coating, jamming. And it also did have a, an active jamming system as well that was effective at uh, several thousand meters. So it did have the ability to protect itself even without any crew on board. And again, the Executive officer, 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 there we go. No, we have not been drinking. Um, communicated with it as well. So he was there as kind of that go between between human and the fully AI inside the uh, inside the ship. The USS Salako herself, like I said, was unlucky 13. She served for a number of years, even decades. But in 2171, during a, a uprising, she was the only Marine Corps ship to actually be damaged. And then in 2176, so just a couple years before Aliens, she had a pretty major docking accident. Just ask Mir, the space station, how those were, uh, with a gateway station. In addition, there were several training accidents, friendly fire, uh, onboard fires, which are a big deal in space for sure. 
She was chosen with a relatively light crew of 13 military personnel plus two civilian advisors. She was scheduled for decommissioning in 2184, so she was still serviceable, but it, entering the end of her life, and plans were to sell her off to the private sector, the commercial market. But of course, uh, that wouldn't necessarily work out. The uh, trip to LV-426 was to take uh, three to four weeks, depending on exact things. So, uh, you know, a month or less. Again, it's able to do about three quarters light year a day. At uh, sub light speeds, typical acceleration was about 0.5 g, although it could accelerate to just over 0.1 g and it had artificial gravity. And uh, in the real world, the studio model was about five feet long. But it was only made on one side. <laughs> so it probably explains why there's a lot of detailing on the vertical, but not a whole lot on the other axes. And it was considered quite impressive. It was also done to kind of resemble a submarine in space, or even a gun in space, kind of setting the tone. By the way, James Cameron is actually quite a big fan of firearms, at least in his own way. So that's the Salako herself getting folks there. So it could get to orbit, but as you'd expect based on the way this thing's designed, it in no way could even enter atmosphere, much less land. So to get from the ship to the surface, we would need our next craft. The UD-4L Cheyenne dropship. This was technically a tactical assault transport. Again, on the mission, two would be carried. Smartass and Bug Stomper. Although, the Conestoga class could carry up to eight for certain situations, but not common. This began life, the design, the original uh, UD-4As and Bs, as a transport, pure and simple. But it was expanded into a support role, support craft, as you get into later variants like the H and the L here, and the L was the version in the film. It um, is a little over 25 meters long, and is out to 15.3 meters with weapon pod deployed and of course take off a couple of meters when they're stowed up. It, it weighs in at about 18,600 kilograms and fully loaded max weight it's about uh, 40, excuse me, 34,600 kilograms so yeah, that gives you an idea of the cargo capacity. It is capable of Mach 12. It can go from the ship in space, dropping down into atmosphere and back. It has two Republic TF-900 turbofan type engines, plus it has two rocket engines for hovering. It has a crew of two, a pilot and a co-pilot slash uh, crew chief cargo manager. And it can carry up to 60 marines in the hold, or it can carry one M577 APC or other you know, hardware equipment. So pretty versatile there, pretty flexible. It has a tri-layer skin made, made of ceramic and carbon fiber for both endurance and radar absorption resistance and of course EM protection. Of course it is not capable of FTL. This is from a ship to a planet. It's not meant for long range. Hence the whole dropping out part. This is basically going back and forth but it can provide support 
while Marines are on the ground. Again, it started off as a transport, but oh, did it get weapons. And as you see here, there's a lot sticking out of the Eagle Moss model. Probably the most prominent one would be the GAU 113B cannon here. This is a Gatling type cannon firing 25 millimeter projectiles, presumably caseless, using 900 round drum magazines to feed it that can be swapped out. But that's that's really just the beginning. Just the kind of first fixed weapon. This has lots that can be swapped in and out, as you might notice from things sticking out of this craft. Stowed and launched from four primary folding weapons pods. These were modular weapons. We have 12 of the larger scale Mark 10 Zeus rockets. And then we have up to 32 of the smaller Mark 16 Banshee. We have eight guided Mark 88 missiles. And we have seven of the AGM-220 Hellhound missiles. And other weapons can be stowed as well, and or just depending on the roll. So very well armed for what it is, <clears throat> and very flexible. So these were definitely combat, combat vessels, combat types. And again, we have several variations in use, even some specializing in space. But ours from Alien is a marine dropship. So, you know, that's what we're going to really focus on. So, our dropship in the film is piloted by Corporal Colette Farrow and co-piloted by the crew chief, the weapons officer, Dan Spunkmeyer. Mentioning them here now because we don't have figures of them, probably never will, and they pretty much just served as those roles. Uh, Pharaoh is said to just be a typical pilot, and Spunkmeyer was you know, a, a, a private first class. By the way, uh, Pharaoh, if I didn't mention it a second ago, was a corporal. Should have been a sergeant, but then they didn't want her to outrank. So, yeah. But um, Spunkmeyer was actually pretty laid back and helpful, friendly. He was quite a bit younger than her too. And he was one of the few that actually liked and seemed to respect Bishop over here. By the way, when we were kids, we used to call Bishop Bis Bisquick. I, I don't know why. Um, kids. But either way, those are the two crew. Obviously they died when the first one crashed, but that's kind of getting ahead of ourselves. In the real world, James Cameron based the UD-4, not unsurprisingly, on the Huey, the UH-1. Uh, that, that's why it even has kind of the similar story of starting off as a pure transport and then being put into the gunship role. It's basically a helicopter without helicopters, kind of in, also involving the newer technology of the, of the 80s of, of uh, jump jets like the Harrier. So... Yeah, makes perfect sense. I um, I like the design. I really like the Sulaco from Eagle Moss. It works well being die-cast. It's a fixed thing. I've said this before in other videos, but this one, though, I, I, I don't like it that it's the Eagle Moss kind of fixed design. I think if someone else did one that had moving parts, it'd be a lot more interesting. For example, the landing skids are down here. It'd be a nice one. You could retract them, either plugging in different modules like on a Corgi or folding them in. But the main thing to me are the weapons pods. Yeah, it looks cool with them deployed, and you really wouldn't want one with them not. But it would be nice to be able to either plug them in or not and plug in panels where they're folded in, or if possible, to fold them in. It would also be nice to be able to open the cargo hold and to have... A little APC rollout. So in that sense, 
it's okay as a static model. Might have been neat if they made two versions of this at Eagle Moss. One kind of in flight mode, one in landing mode, you know, with the ramp down and little APC and then one all folded up. But I digress. So, this would drop off the M577, the APC. And that's our next vehicle. The M577 APC. Specifically in the film, we have the A3 variant, which has a slightly different power plant and different armament we'll get to. With the rear turret in the up position, it's about 8.6 meters long, with it folded down, pointing backwards in the stowed position like it would be on the uh, dropship. It's about 9.2. And side to side, it's about 3.4 meters. And it is considerably lightened for dropship rolls at under 15,000 kilograms. Which uh, it kind of needs to be to, to work and fit. It holds a crew of two as standard, a driver on the port side, and then a tactical officer, commanding officer, typically in the tactical station towards the rear here where the turret's at. And then it has room seating for 12, plus lots of stowage for equipment and supplies. In fact, they can carry up to three days worth of ammo, food, medicine, so, you know, pretty well appointed because it's meant not only as a just a strictly speaking APC, but also a mobile command vehicle for short term at least. They went with wheels instead of tracks to save on weight. Also, so that they could have more flexibility and speed. This can get up to about 150 kilometers per hour. It has a gas turbine engine, and uh, it is armored, although since it's an airborne unit, somewhat lightly so. It has 7 millimeters of armor standard. It's a composite with uh, layers of 2 millimeter, 2 millimeter, and 3 millimeter different material, and the wheels themselves are protected with some kind of run-flat stuff. That said, it's really only protected against small arms fire, light fire. It can't go against anti-materiel stuff. But, you know, the trade-off is it can be dropped in speed and it's well appointed inside. It has infrared, spotlights, other sensory equipment, communications gear. And, of course, it does have some guns itself. In the front here, in this smaller turret, we have two RE-700 Gatling guns. They have a 1700 round magazine. They can be loaded with high explosive, armor piercing, other rounds. And then in the back we have a turret that is flexible. And the A3 version has particle beams, which are good against hardened targets out to two to three kilometers, or against softer targets even past that so pretty long range it also can support and launch smaller smart missiles and has a few other tactical abilities there's a large crew door on the starboard side plus emergency hatches for the driver and in the back as well so yeah you can get in and out as need be Pretty, pretty neat critter here, if I do say so myself. Okay, so this just decided to come off its stand twice in a row. The second time, deciding to go to the side and go for Bug Stomper. <laughs> in the film, the uh, section has a dedicated driver, although many will drive it. That begins with Bishop. And the commander is the same squad commander, which would end up being Gorman in the beginning. But of course.
course later on that would change. And this is kind of the main mobile base. The, that was the uh, microphone. Hello. Yeah, this is getting complicated. Anyway. <laughs> this was the main uh, thing for them in the beginning. And it's really interesting. In the real world, this was created by heavily modifying a uh, aircraft tower, which was over 60,000 kilograms. They had to really shave it down quite a bit and uh, get it to work in the power station. So it was a real practical model, which is always cool when that happens. Gives it that believability. And um, aside from the fact that it doesn't really like to stay on its stand, as we just saw, I really like this model from Eagle Moss more than I thought. I kind of resisted picking it up because at the time I really wasn't doing tanks and ground vehicles much, but it's heavy. It's all metal, except the parts you'd expect. Of course, kind of like with the dropship, it would have been neat if this had moving parts to have rolling wheels and for this uh, rear turret to be able to go up and down. And maybe the front turret pivot too. This is kind of where you see the pros and cons to the Eagle Moss uh, system, as it were. But, oh well. At least it is a good size and well detailed. NECA did one in their Cinema Machines line years ago and it, it just wasn't as detailed. So that was the primary kind of mobile command base seen in the first part of the film they are all inside it in the dropship of course it takes up the entire bay so one final thing for this video let's talk about the support equipment that the squadron had once on the ground a platoon or a section depending on the size would have quite a few elements for organic support here we have the UA-571C automated sentry gun or drone gun with its control. This is getting away from Eagle Moss from getting into the NECA. It would also typically have some flamethrowers to pass out when and if needed. And it would have two RPG types. It would sometimes carry up to 18 small missiles for surface to surface and typically one larger multiple launch mortar system. Plus, there would be sensory gear, detection gear, to set up a perimeter of up to one kilometer to support everything. And that's the, uh, the heavy equipment that would come down, and we're getting down to the robotic guns and to the human or synthetic element. And that feels like a good place to end this video. And we'll do a continuation with part two, looking at more of the equipment, what was issued, the structure of the Marines, the platoon, the section, the squads, the different types, how things were done. So, yep. And we end where we begin. Hope you enjoyed it. It's a lot of fun making these. They, they always relax me. Appreciate you watching this part. If you haven't seen the other two parts, please do check them out. And uh, let me know what you think. The NECA figures are, like I said, the 7-inch scale and the Eagle Moss die cast are of their kind of medium scale, which is always fun. As always, if you could, please like share, subscribe, and if you kind of like military history and accoutrement equipment, check out the main Mishiko channel, where we do a lot of this. With that, this is Misha. Catch you very soon next time. So each section had drivers in the beginning. We had Bishop again, and the commander was Lieutenant Gorman, although this would change throughout the film. Great.